I met Lick later in 64. And Lick was talking to me about what the important things in the future would be, what we needed to do. And one of them was to build a network to connect all the computers together so we could share knowledge. Lick left ARPA, left Ivan Sutherland in charge. Ivan Sutherland came down to run the ARPA program that Lick had started. Late 65, I guess, Ivan decided to go back to research, and that left me uh, uh, as director of the Office of Computer Research in ARPA. I hired Taylor. I recruited him with the understanding. Lick Lider's vision is what, what I want to do. In February of 66, I went in to see my boss, Charlie Hertzfeld, head of ARPA, and proposed that we build uh, an interactive network called the ARPANET. He had kept up well with what Lick had done and Ivan had done before me. Bob told me that he had a secret office in the Pentagon. And I said, oh really? Why is it secret? He said, I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to show you. And it went to the different corridor, but the same floor. And the secret office, it had terminals. And I had three terminals connected to three different systems that we were supporting. One at MIT, one at Berkeley, and one in Santa Monica. To use one of these facilities, I would go to its terminal. To go to use another facility, I would get up and go to another terminal, and likewise to the third. And I said, can you use this terminal to talk to that side? No. I said, that's ridiculous, fix it. Why not have one terminal and go anywhere you want to a, in, throughout a network? Uh, and that's. This, that's the simple idea for the ARPANET. And it's clear that, uh, first of all, I would have to hire a program manager to, to look after just this one project. February of 66, I went to a fellow named Larry Roberts and asked him to come be the program manager for this new project. And so Bob kept on pursuing me to come in the end of 66 to build a network. It is staggering to think that the original messages were only one letter in length. So I was thinking, if I had to pick a letter, what letter speaks volumes? So I decided on Z, Z. And here, Z today means Christina Holly. Z, who has put her special stamp uh, as a tech engineer and a creator all over the place, including a lot of letters, MIT, USC, and curator of the first TEDx. So here she is, mining for the answers to the age-old question, winner take all, question mark, you'll find out. So the internet, with a promise of free flow of information and democratization of knowledge and uh, innovation and disruption coming from everywhere, but the truth is, a lot of the influence comes from the folks up at the top. And I'm wondering, is that a feature or a bug? Either way, it's uh, definitely the way we live, work, and play is heavily influenced by these top dogs. And I'm really excited to welcome two of them to talk with us today about the internet, the future of innovation, and a whole lot more. First, I'd like to introduce the former CEO of Google and Alphabet, Eric Schmidt. and the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, Jamie Diamond. So first I'd like to start with uh, thinking way back. What was, maybe you can share a story of what was your first memory of the internet? Okay, welcome everybody, thrilled to be here. I just mentioned it, my brother was a physicist, uh, MIT, University of Chicago, PhD, IBM Labs, Niels Bohr Institute. I went to visit him, I think, at the Fermi Labs in Chicago, and he was showing me this little thing that they used to share information among universities, and I guess it was called the ARPANET at the time. That's the first I remember, and that was probably early 70s, something like that. And how about you, Eric? By the way, let's thank UCLA for organizing all my heroes in one place. <laughs> Amazing, right. huh? I mean... It's like a um, candy store. <laughs> so, so let's think. I've been doing this for 45 years. Everything in my life has started because they started this. I mean, how can you express your gratitude? So in my case, I was working at Xerox Park, 
and this was before TCP, it was using NCP. And I remember working with the PDP-10 clone that we had using an IMP. Uh, <laughs> That's a lot of acronyms. Yes. <laughs> this audience understands. Uh, to, uh, to upgrade from NCP to CCP. And I, did, I, I had no idea what scaling looked like. Mm. I, you know, I think other people saw it, but I certainly didn't. And so how did that, those early experiences influence you later? Um, did, did that, uh, like, and how, can you tell just a little bit of how you became the chairman or the uh, CEO of Google from there? Well, in, in my case, I think it's important to remember that the generation that I represent and, our, and my heroes who've been on the stage before me represent is we were sort of uh, technical nerd types as opposed to business strategists, technologists, visionaries. And uh, we were very, very busy in very narrow corners doing things which were incredibly interesting to us. And I think that's, uh, it's important to remember how simple and small the industry was then compared to starting in, in the 1990s. You can see that, for example, the Mosaic, the Netscape IPO was $2 billion, right? Today, compare that to today, it's hundreds of times, uh, the, the same kind of hype is associated with hundreds of times, thanks to the world that Jamie has built and the financial structures and globalization of all of this. So, so in my case, I think I was largely a technical manager for many of those years. And, and I feel like I've sort of, today I think I would still be the same personality but less successful <laughs> because the people today are combine the skills that I have but they have many other skills as well. It's the globalization has brought in even better talent. So you came in from the technical side. Jamie, you came in, of course, from the, the business and finance side. Um, so can you, let's take on the question of the panel, winner take all. Um, maybe, Jamie, you can give a few th thoughts about, is that true, and is that a feature or a bug? Well, it's a, first of all, it's a complicated subject. <laughs> Let's, okay. let's resume that conversation, and uh, I, I truly think we're going to get back to some of those issues later in the day. So, see? Per, per, perhaps you should ask the question again. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, and what was the see, question? See, see, what, see what happens the next time. <laughs> uh, I'm a little bit afraid. <laughs> What's next? Um, winner take all. Is that <laughs> feature or a bug? Well, I think it's, it's a little bit of both. You know, in this, this very competitive world, we've always had a little bit of winner-take-all. You've had, and going back to the past, you've had monopolies and, you know, certain technology, you can dominate something very quickly, something like that. But also, you have to look at a lot of those companies, they didn't survive either. Something came and knocked them down. It's always new technology, something like that. So I'd say it's kind of, sometimes it's winner-take-all for a time period. It's not forever. Sometimes people with governments take action, sometimes competitors, mostly technology-driven. So what are you the most excited about that's going to maybe be the next big disruption? Look, I, look the, world, the world is going to double in size in the next 20 years. You know, the millennials in the room who sometimes we read about are very depressed are going to inherit the most prosperous nation the planet's ever seen. We're going to hand it to you down the road. And it'll be cleaner too, by the way. And the technology coming is astounding, you know, particularly AI, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit. And mankind will be better and better and better off, but we got to take care of the bad parts, the nuclear, climate, uh, and disruption if you have you know, people lose jobs too fast or something like that. So, but we're, look, we try to be smart. We should have policies that fix the problems and then have these huge benefits from you know, what takes place in this world. And, and uh, you know, banks are just financial vehicles. You know, we just finance entities, whether it's Google's of the world or, or other companies and stuff like that. And, uh, but I'm quite excited about the future. I'm, but that doesn't mean I don't worry about a whole long list of stuff. <laughs> Eric, um, what, what are the things, because you're no longer at Google, so what are you the well, most... I'm actually mean? still uh, an employee. But I'm a technical advisor. Right, okay. Uh, I'm, <laughs> it's important to know I'm <laughs> Sorry about still that, yeah. subject to Google rules. <laughs> no, I, I, I got you, off... I think it freed up a little bit of your time, though, now that you're... Certainly a bit more time. I, I agree with everything that Jamie said, and I think uh, you articulated it you know, better than I would. Um, I think it's, it's important to understand the history. We're here celebrating the, the internet. And many of the characters and the systems and so forth um, of the early period of that were inspired by the anti-war movement. That there was this sense that democratization and that you could free up using this technology 
individuals, individual viewpoints, uh, individual freedoms, uh, democracy, so forth and so on. They, uh, much of the sort of core liberalism and optimism of the internet tribe, of which I'm a proud member, comes from that 50, 50 60 years ago. Um, the question is, is, is it still true today? Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that there's a duality, that most of my career, I've spent my time working on decentralized systems, literally uh, going from the IBM mainframe to the PC to then the, the internet and then the phone and so forth, and that decentralization and the distribution of open so source software and so forth drove this sense of extraordinary opportunity and freedom. At exactly the same time, there was also a centralization around big data, um, economic power, advertising, all the things that everybody here is aware of. And I think both are true. So it's not fair to say that we're going to a world of centralized systems with monopoly power in the same sense that it was not also not correct for me to 30 years ago say the world will be completely decentralized. Mm. An example that I would offer is that while you have large corporations, large uh, governments and so forth, you also have open source technology and diffusion which gives individuals great power as we just saw um, in, the sh in the short demonstration that we just had during the, during the conference. The fact that people are more empowered on both sides of it is the genius of the internet. The core design argument of the internet was that the intelligence is on the edge, right? It's called the edge to edge principle, and that you basically, you connect everything and then you don't constrain what happens on the edges. So you get both centralization and decentralization. Mm -hmm. That's why this is so hard for people to sort out. Which is true, is it centralization or decentralization? The answer is it's both. Well, it's interesting, you, you're, um, you talked about how uh, the, the, the sort of the data is such a key part of it, and it seems like, I don't know if you'd agree, that in the, the old economy, the inputs into the economy were property and labor, and now more of our behaviors and the data are more of it, and because it's so easy for it to, to be centralized, and now there's also uh, technology can mediate the gig economy. Is, is there a new feudalism that's happening? Or uh, what's the... Um, what are the new dynamics in that economy and are there ways of structuring both the technology platforms and also the, 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 the markets so that it leads to better social ends? So, so the way I would express that is first I think uh, what you're seeing is seeing the effect of globalization and digitization at the same time. And digitization means far more efficient systems and globalization means many more players much more competition, much more efficiency, all of that. They, and they lead to all of these outcomes, right, with, with good and bad outcomes. In general, these things are positive. My challenge to the audience here is, and I say, I'll say this in a rhetorical way, so you guys are such great entrepreneurs. Why don't you build companies that build products that address middle-class wages? Why don't you figure out a way to build companies that cause people to get $10,000 more income in the sort of middle-class wage groups, that, and those jobs are largely disappearing? What do we as an industry have to do to give those people the, ta the tools to become their own entrepreneurs, their own creative people, to raise their wages, right? To be more productive and to be happier, right? We need these people, right, who we, dis we sort of talk about in aggregate as individuals to be successful, to be great consumers. I want more happy people, more productive people, more wealth generated in that, those segments. I'm worried that because of the rise of inequality and globalization, we're, we're not, we're, we're keeping our, uh, we don't have our eye on the middle class. But Jamie, your industry uh, values and rewards the unicorns. So how do we then do what Eric's we, talking about? Uh, so first of all, my view is technology is the best thing that ever happened to mankind. And technology is all different things, even including institutions and laws and rules. And, you know, but if you go back to the 1900s, we had 40 million people working on farms. Now it's a million. We're better off for that. And the, the society adjusted very quickly to new things and created new jobs. So I, I wouldn't be afraid of it. And you're not going to really be able to control it, because if it's not here, it's somewhere else. And it's kind of like it seeps everywhere. But it is the reason why you know, the, the young kids in the room, you're going to live to 100. You, you, you're, you're being gifts, given gifts that are unbelievable. And then it's the job of companies to figure out how to use it. So I, like, I remember sitting with Bill Gates in 1994, something like that, right after he gave the Banks of Dinosaurs speech, and we were putting Windows NT into a trading floor for the first time. You should have used my products. Yeah. Well, you didn't have them yet. <laughs> oh, no, we did. We, you were Sun Microsystems. Yes, we, yes. We did. We were we, selling those, too. We had a whole bunch I of I still that. remember. We had a whole <laughs> bunch of that, too. And I used to go see uh, McNeely every now and then. And, 
but my point is, so he said to me, uh, I, 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 I told him I disagreed with that, and he, we were talking about programmers, and we had more programmers, at, I was the president of Travelers, than Microsoft did. Mm -hmm. And he said, why? And he didn't fully understand that we, you know, we ran 7,000 applications. And now the pace and the speed, and every one of those has AI associated to it, risk, fraud, marketing, design, and, and we're trying to bring, so we bank four million small businesses. So one of the things we try to do is, what can we do for that class of people, the small business, the entrepreneur of color, uh, uh, the young mother who you know, needs to be educated on education? Like, you can go on our phones now and click and get your credit score. And it'll also tell you how to improve it, why it went up or why it went down. And these things are just, I mean, they're just beginning, and they're going to be off the charts over time. So I think it's very exciting. We just have to be very careful about those left behind. It is possible that in our society that people, when they used to graduate high school, didn't even graduate high school, and you can work with your hands and work hard, that you can go to a factory or something and earn a living wage eventually, buy a house, buy a car, have kids. And that may not be true anymore. 50% of Americans, 50% of Americans, earn $15 an hour or less, 40%. And you know, there's something like 15% earn $10 an hour or less, and 40 million don't have medical insurance. So we are causing huge consternation out there by not fixing some of these problems and supporting policies and programs that get education right, get opportunity right. You know, if we have to do a negative income tax, we should do a negative income tax so that everyone benefits from this wonderful society. And Eric was talking about how uh, entrepreneurship might be part of the solution. I'm curious how many of you out there are entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs? Yeah, quite a few. A lot of hands. <laughs> and of course, the, every dream of a tech entrepreneur, every, uh, in any case, is it wants to be like Google, right? It's, it's, it's like a dream to be like Google, but maybe the grass is greener on the other side. Um, what is it like to be um, a big player and in innovating? And what are you the most afraid of? Because Jamie was saying, oh, there's always disruption. So it's, you know. What are the well, disruptions that you're the most afraid of? So, so I was um, way back when I was joking with you about Bill, Bill and, and Microsoft. Um, Microsoft was sort of the first really big one of these companies that sort of I watched operate. And what I concluded about Microsoft at the time, this is 25 years ago, is that they made their own weather system and that their internal weather dynamics would determine their fate. And I think that that is principally true for tech companies that each of the large tech companies, my personal opinion now, um, th what will really happen to each and every one of them is that there will be some disruption that they miss, and that when they miss that disruption, they won't get that time back. Mm -hmm. right? And that's why running the tech companies is so difficult, and why each of the companies is different, but they're, they're, the people are very, very smart in all of them, and they're running as fast as they can. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's illustrative to look at what's going on in China. And China is, is sort of uh, even more intense. Beijing is even more intense than Silicon Valley. You have three large players. You have this principle called 996 from 9 in the morning, 9 at night, 6 days a week. Uh, the work ethic is extraordinary. And they're just frantic, right? And I think that that, when you have a, a new development and a globalized business, I think that's what happens inside of companies. Mm. And what did you do at Google? to try to ensure that there was constant innovation and keeping track of the disruptions and were you, you know, to, to help share some of the things that you... It's a combination of two things. You, you, you won't get the innovation right from the top or the bottom, but you can systematize the innovation if you use both levels. So we worked extremely hard, and today still work very hard, to have bottoms-up teams, bottoms-up ideas. There's something called 20% time, it's the long speech I used to give. Um, and at the same time, the senior leadership was highly technical, understood the business, and so what we would do is we would stage reviews, which were brutal, um, of is this going to work, how does it do it, you know, how do we make it happen? And you can drive that very, very hard. Um, and the, the particular mechanism that we used was in fact pioneered by Microsoft, mm -hmm. using very technical product managers to drive it. Jamie, it took you a while to implement cloud, and I'm curious what what held that up a bit, and is that in, do you think that that's a part of being a bigger company, is that you're... No, I, I made a mistake. It was years ago, but I, I, when I got to bank on JP Morgan, I took back all the outsourced stuff, data centers, engineers, data scientists, networks, you name it, 20,000 people. We now have like 55,000 people in technology. And when I first heard about the cloud, and I think you have to have people at this table, 
Like our technology people are at every table. Every system is being built, every sales, every product, every, because it's, it, it's a team. You, you know, they can't work without the sales people, the marketing people, and vice versa. They all can work generally without the finance people, the compliance people. But, um, but so I thought, and I think it has to be part of your company. You can't like outsource that part of your company. Like, it's like outsourcing parenthood or something like that. It just simply doesn't work. When I first heard about the cloud, I just heard, that's just another way that I'm gonna run my stuff on your data center. And software as a service has been around forever, so I'm not really commenting on that. Uh, but then I flew out here one day, and I went to all the I went to Google, I went to Apple and Amazon and Facebook. I had a whole team come out bitching and moaning about it, but I made them spend a week out in Silicon Valley. And flying back, I said to them, do cloud, do it to me, do it as fast as you can. Uh, because I didn't understand the compute power that can be deployed in cloud, the drop and, you know, kind of the, the development speed, the, the fitness of developers, the ability to, I call it like drop. You can just say, I want to add this data to this analysis. You just kind of click and drop it. And the speed and the pace and the agile and small teams doing stuff. So we went full speed ahead after that. So we're probably, I don't know if at the forefront for banks. But the issue with banks is the, it's enormously, we have enormous rules, regulations, requirements, you know, third-party processing. So actually, we just finished uh, uh, doing stuff with Google. You know, they got to understand what we need and why we need it. And so uh, it's, it's full speed ahead. But I would say cloud, AI, and the related digital uh, are real and the platforms that you can deploy. So we're, we're going to deploy a hybrid structure. Some will be public, some will be private. We'll use exactly the same tools in the private cloud, i.e. your own data centers, as the public. And then for different reasons, we can run these things in different places. It, it's helpful to remember that this stuff is relatively new in human society. Uh, it, commercial use of the internet was, I think, roughly 1991. Um, during that time, the connectivity was still relatively limited. Um, companies like Google and Facebook and so forth came out of that late 90s model. Uh, but even then, we were focused on PCs and traditional servers. And it hasn't been until the combination of cloud computing and mobile, mobile devices that the architecture completely changed. So today, if you were going to create a brand new bank, right, which would be difficult because of all the regulatory issues and so forth, you would start by saying it'll be phones only, uh, back-end cloud only. And by the way, that's how China works. So WeChat, uh, China is a financial services leader far larger than the United States because they skipped all those steps and everybody uses their phones, right? You guys are working on technologies in this area. You talked about uh, regulation and uh, we have a question from the audience. What is the appropriate level of governmental oversight and regulation over the internet? The internet. So look, look we're always going to have government regulation. And you're asking the right question, what's the proper regulation? Because very often people talk about more or less. It's not more or less, it's good. And regulations like anything else should be constantly looked at. Did it work? Why didn't it work? Very often regulation, the, the consequences are the complete opposite of what the regulators wanted. And so you gotta be very careful with how you implement things, the unintended consequences. Like you know, a lot of the big bank regulation actually created modes for big banks. I, that's not what I wanted. I like competition, but that's what it did because it makes it very hard for other people to compete. So the internet, I mean, I think it's, it's, ba it's basically brand new, so the world's just trying to focus on what you need to do. I do think that you do need some uh, social media regulations that are properly written and properly thought through. And, you know, particularly around all this misinformation around democracy. Like, who can say what on the internet without violating, on a social platform, without violating the, the First Amendment? Uh, I think is going to be critical. So you know that's a Russian, that's not a Russian, that's a, an American citizen, that was a paid for thing. And we both think there are ways that that can actually be done to, to uh, properly regulate speech on it. And so the only other thing I'd say about regulation on the internet, if you are a company, and it's very hard when your company is look at this way, like are you misusing your market power sometimes? So if you're, you, it's like the, the old company store when you have a railroad, and they, you know, they own the town, and they make their workers shop at their store, and they have to pay twice as much for milk. It's just not right. And there's a little of that taking place on the internet, where people are using their systems inside. And sometimes the executives of the companies don't even know that they're, you know, preferencing this thing over that thing. And so we've we've had a couple of disputes with internet companies over that very thing. That was not the contract. You can't show preference. You have to have it open. Um, the um, I think it's worth stating that the creation of the internet uh, was implausible in the way it actually worked because when the the existing networks were merged in the 80s and 90s instead of go doing complicated business contracts between them they just agreed to collectively do hot potato routing and other mechanisms without charging each other 
right, in some complicated way. And for a while, the tier one players, right, who knew each other, actually had peering arrangements where they didn't, they, they, they didn't really care too much about the details, and it was roughly in balance. That is extremely hard to get in a regulatory way or in a competitive way, because they're all natural competitors. So the people who built this, and again, this was you know, 20, 25 years ago, had a greater goal, which was total connectivity. Today, we have the beneficiaries of that connectivity, and we see it, its impact on society, and everybody doesn't like something, right? So the first question is, I don't like it, let's see if we can regulate it, or so forth. The problem with regulation is that it's often too early, and because of the way the regulations work, they're written not to a goal, but rather to a mechanism. So there are plenty of laws over privacy and respect for rights and e business commerce and so forth. Let's start by applying them in this context, uh, because they're already in existence. I worry a lot about the, well, you have to regulate A or B or C. Um, I, again, this is 15 years ago. People would say, well, we should regulate search. And I said, have a good time. You tell us. Search is fundamentally a ranking problem. You tell us in law how to rank A, B, and C. And by the way, we'll follow it, right, because we follow the law. But you'll have a great deal of trouble writing down how to choose between this answer and that answer. And I know because we do, okay? <laughs> it's a really hard problem when we do the best that we can and we're not perfect, right? So be careful about a hardcore regulation in these systems which are information-based and try to focus your ire on the extreme cases. So for example, election interference is a crime, okay? By the way, it has been a crime, so let's make sure it's still a crime. Well, I wonder if some of it is self-regulating because I feel like uh, trust is such an important foundational element, especially in finance, but in any sort of large company. And um, I wonder whether there's a lot of eroding of that trust right now. I mean, just look at the um, Zuckerberg's uh, testimony on the uh, Capitol Hill and just, um, just a lot of concern about privacy and surveillance and data use. And I'm wondering, um, how does that impact your businesses? And are there things that we can do in order to preempt the need for the regulation so that it uh, does not become a problem? So generally for us, so we have huge amounts of data and, but pretty much by law, we can't share it. We can't sell it, we can't do stuff like that. So this is your credit card, your debit card, small businesses, what you spend on, where you buy, and when you buy, and stuff like that. So uh, it is used internally for risk, fraud, marketing, et cetera. And of course, you know, sometimes the client, like you all, give your bank passcode out, which gives someone access to all that data, which I don't think the American public understands. I'm sure, I don't think American public remotely understands how their data is being used, shared, stuff like that. And people come with rules in place to give you that. Like, I think it's, they're simple. Should you know what people have? Yes. Should you be able to correct it or delete it? Yes. Having said that, that's really hard to implement. <laughs> and I think, I, I hope government does it very thoughtfully as opposed to laws that you can't keep, you, know, you don't even know what they mean with some of these things sometimes. So well, in fact, the laws you're referring to uh, were done in the 1970s. They've been in place for a long time and they've allowed the banking system to grow and and have the positive impact that it's had. Um, in our case, I can say that, that uh, I encounter people who have this sort of strange idea of business executives. The business executives either don't know what's going on or don't care or are only motivated on money. Uh, and that's certainly not been my experience. Uh, at a minimum, they're, they're motivated by their own reputations, the impact that they can have, shareholder value and things like that. And today, these businesses are not just focused on money. They're focused, remember, we have employee activists too. We have, we have consumer activists. We have government activists. We have shareholder activists. We have regional and local activists who are worried about our impact on the society around us. So for all of those things, the CEOs and the leaders have to be concerned about all of these constituencies. So the correct answer is to have a set of values which Google publishes. Right, which you can read and you can debate whether we're following them, but we believe that those are our values. And I don't think you can run a significant company today without a set of values. And Jamie's articulated his firms, and I've articulated ours. And the values can be different, but I think you have to articulate them. It's interesting you mentioned that because there's a question I, I've always wanted to ask you, and it's, it's relevant. Um, 
why do you go to Burning Man? And there's 10 <laughs> principles behind Burning Man, right? So it's in a similar way. It's very explicit. I'm curious, what do you get out of it? Well, I enjoy Burning Man because I've been going long enough, and of course I come out of the Berkeley, the Berkeley Bohemian world from way back when, um, when I had much longer hair. The uh, Burning Man is interesting because it's a temporary city that has grown up to 75,000. And when I was young, like everyone, everyone else, you know, California liberal, I assumed that anarchy was the correct structure of life and that all, if you just got rid of these sort of needling governments, life would be much better. It's interesting that Burning Man every year has more and more rules. <laughs> it's funny how that happens. Funny how, how you get 75,000 people and you have to have a lot of rules. Well, and sometimes they're very subtle, too. They're, the infrastructure creates yeah. certain social dynamics. And there's a government, and there's regulatory bodies, yep. and so forth and the so on. The way the city is and, laid and, out. And, you know, they, they look different, but they fundamentally exist. Are there analogs on the internet? Do you think that there's um, ways that we can signal and create infrastructure in a way that changes the social dynamic? And have you seen that in a way that's been really successful? I don't want to encourage too much central planning on the internet. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that the extraordinary explosion of services and wealth and people and jobs and computer scientists, computer science is the number one major in, the, in all, all the universities, including here now. Uh, all, you know, all the top universities are producing this enormous cadre of, of folks. Um, I don't want to get in the way of that creative engine that creative engine, which will apply to not just computer science, but also finance and healthcare and biology and physics and so forth and so on, um, I don't want to put constraints on it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm worried that the, the reaction to errors, you know, edge cases and so forth, will be an overreaction, right? And then we'll, we'll somehow we'll lose the magic that got all of us to this point, that a young person here in the audience can honestly say, well, I'll be a billionaire at 28 unless I go surfing today. You know, I mean, this is like incredible conversations. And um, you sit there and you talk to these folks, um, and it's actually possible. They're not, they're not insane. <laughs> I'd love to hear a little bit about um, both of your uh, philanthropic uh, activities and where you like to focus your energies. So. Uh so mine are mostly through J.P. Morgan, but I do want to describe it real quickly. My wife does a tremendous amount of work skills initiatives in New York City. These are getting kids, you know, apprenticeships, internships in high schools, community college, et cetera, so they have a livelihood when they get out. And that's one thing that we've done a terrible job at in America. We should be great at it. We're not good. It's got to be done locally because you need the pipeline. You know, what you need in Silicon Valley is different than what you need in, in Waco, Texas, or something like that. And, um, but J.P. Morgan, you know, it is... It is a real important part of what we do, and I think it's part of the trust. You have to earn trust every day. I mean, we beat, the, our society, we beat everyone to death. I mean, no one is high in that trust thing anymore except firemen, you know, and it's, I, I don't know why everyone is down at very low numbers, but, you know, like, yes, most people, do you trust your lawyer? Yes. Do you trust lawyers? No. Do you trust doctors? No. Do you trust your doctor? Yes. Do you trust, you know, your bank? Yes. Do you trust banks? No. And I don't know why that is, and there's something going on in the, in the uh, source, but one of the things, we believe you've got to be a great community citizen. We operate in 2,000 literally cities around the world, and I look at it no different than if I were in a cornery bakery shop, that when you wake up in the morning, you take care of your customers, you get the ice off the front so a little lady doesn't break her leg, you support the local religious institution or a little league or something like that, because that's society. And when societies do well, everyone does well, people are happier. Uh, and of course, businesses, you know, you look at it, if you are in Venezuela, North Korea, Cuba, well, businesses aren't going to do well. If you can get 2 or 3% growth, then everyone's going to do well. So it makes sense for us to put our muscle in it. I do not, so we're in, like, take Detroit. We're doing affordable housing, work skills. We have an Entrepreneur of Color Fund now, which is spe a special fund for entre you know, small businesses of entrepreneurs who don't have regular access to banking loans to help them grow and expand, to give them the advice that they need and how to negotiate a contract, where to put the next branch, how to negotiate with the government, and then the money they need to grow and expand. And this kind of stuff works. A lot of companies do it. We've got to get elbow grease. And it's also part of my belief, government is, can't do it anymore. It can't do it. It's not fast enough. It can't organize fast enough. It doesn't get the, necessarily the best and the brightest. I'm, I'm not criticizing them. I think that what we need is much more collaboration between business, civic society, universities, hospitals, 
uh, ch uh, charitable foundations, et cetera, business and government, and we will fix society's problems. And if we don't get active on that, I think they're going to just get worse, and society will get worse. You know, what, what Jamie's talking about is this incredible optimism of the American people, right? When you actually see them, and you, you described it perfectly. So I've historically worked on environmental issues, ocean science issues. Recently, I've been working on um, AI techniques applied to science and the hardcore stuff, including some stuff in this area, which I'm very, very proud of. And I think we can make real progress in science. But what I've recently decided is what I really care about is global talent. That if you talk to the next generation, literally the teenagers, college students, and so forth, the, the number of Einsteins, the number of sort of extraordinary intellect people, if we can just get them into, you know, these are diverse, uh, diverse, uh, inclusive co communities where they can learn, support each other, grow, get funding, they will change the world. They'll change healthcare, they'll change science, they'll change governance, they'll change society. So I've decided to spend the majority of my time on that because of that inherent, incredible optimism mm -hmm. of our Which society. is also why we should give a green card to every kid who goes to our universities here from, who's a foreign national, they should all get a green card and stay because Absolutely. They, they will create the future for us too. Uh, starting, starting here with all the foreign students at UCLA, uh, extraordinary talent, why would you take them, educate them to the, to the guilt in the United States and then send them to another country to compete with us? Really <laughs> smart. Sorry. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe to wrap up, you have uh, a few uh, pieces of advice for our um, students or aspiring entrepreneurs and the folks in the audience, uh, especially because many of them maybe want to be like you and maybe other, others just want to compete against you. Um, any uh, final tips to get noticed and to make it? it it's, it's, a, first of all, it's a long road. You know, like give it everything you got, but you're going to have, uh, you're going to fall down and stand up. But the most important things are always the same, character and culture, work ethic, give a damn about your fellow human being, tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Know you're not, you know, have the humility to know that you're not always the smartest one in the room. And there are a lot of people who know a lot more about certain subjects than you do. And learn how to work with people because that, that actually, and he just gave me a book to read about, it's called Coach, about Bill Campbell, that was one of Eric's coaches. It's just it, about the importance of the team working together to get the best out of people. And that comes out of heart and humility. It doesn't come out of brains. And so there are all these things in life that you learn. You learn sometimes the hard way and sometimes you have a gut instinct for it. But those are, those are the most important things, I think. Right, I mean, completely agree with that. Very, very well said. I think um, what, what I would say to folks is that, so when I was your age, I didn't realize that the generation before me, which was on this stage a few minutes ago, had built a platform of enormous scale that I did not understand would change my life. So I'm telling you now that our generation, my generation, has built that platform. It's right in front of you, right? It's accessible to you, it's very inexpensive, and it will be the tool of your dreams, it will be the tool of your impact. Uh, the financial system will allow you to raise companies, the community system here at UCLA and the UC system will allow you to find the people that you need, but get yourself organized to solve the problem that you care about it and run it as hard as you can. The life satisfaction of that is enormous. So thank you. Best of luck to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Z, Eric, Jamie. Um, so there are a lot of very strong opinions in the, in the questions that were asked. And uh, again, unfortunately, we just didn't have time to get to a lot of them. Um, a couple of tips. Uh, please try to keep the questions short, just uh, one or two lines in the text box. If they get too long, we literally can't see them on the screen. Um, and try to make them relevant to the session that's actually taking place at the time as opposed to other broader issues. So anyway, our poll right now is going to give some of you a chance to, to really take a jab. Um, is it time to break up the internet giants? I probably don't need to name them, but you know, the fangs, the, you, you know who they are. Uh, obviously, a lot of interest in this uh, from a political perspective at the moment. So this is really one where I think you have an opportunity to help shape this debate and discussion. Okay, uh, some bias towards the top there. 
Um, I think something is coming. All right, we are going to take another short break and watch a video. Thank you. <laughs> 